Witam wszystkich bardzo serdecznie. Kolej, jest to kolejny webinar z serii Racjonalna wizja legalizacji marihuany w Polsce. Dzisiaj jednak porozmawiamy sobie z gościem ze Stanów Zjednoczonych. Mike Wise jest amerykańskim aktywistą, rzecznikiem na rzecz praw pacjentów. Zaczniemy, przejdziemy za chwilę na język angielski. Chciałabym powitać wszystkich, którzy biorą udział w dzisiejszym webinarze. Hello Mike. Uh, it's great to have it's great to have you here uh, today. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, webinar. And please, starting with the first question, if you could just tell our viewers uh, where are you coming from in case of marijuana activism and advocacy for the patients, um, and so for the people who don't really know your roots, just quick introduction, please. Sure. Um, my name is Mike Wise, like she said, um, and I used to have Crohn's disease, which is, if you look up online, it's a disease that they say is incurable. Um, and so I took a, a significant amount of high THC cannabis oil over four months uh, time, and I, I was able to cure my disease. All my symptoms are gone. Sometimes I might have a little tiny thing, but it's not even a flare up. You know, and Crohn's patients have what they call flare-ups where they have to rush to the bathroom and throw up and all that. Um, since I started the oil four years ago, I think I've had maybe one flare-up in four years, which is unheard of when you used to have them every day. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty much cured. I don't have any problems. I can go out and have fun all day and do lectures, go writing, um, you know, and enjoy the day. I don't have to be stuck in a bathroom. Um, and so I told everybody about this online and then everyone kind of was like, hey, can you get oil for 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 my grandmother, or for my mother, or for my sister or my cousin or, you know, I need cannabis oil. Can you get it for me? And so I kind of just started making it for everybody who asked. And, and you know, that was five years ago. And so since then, I've kind of just been known as someone who's a caregiver for patients because I've treated so many people. I think it's over 4,000 people at this point who have messaged me and said, hey, um, I need help, can you get me oil? And then on top of that, I've made tons of educational videos about how to make the oil, how to grow. And these videos have gotten hundreds of thousands of views all over everywhere. So that's kind of what brought me into cannabis activism and why I'm here today, because I want to give back to the plant because it's given so much to me. Yeah, thank you for everything you're doing and uh, where you're coming from. I think that's, that's where uh, some of, uh, quite a lot of activists are coming from uh, as well. They are patients who actually started using cannabis and they felt like it's helping them and they should share this information with other people. Um, well, I'd like to, I know you have a great knowledge about how the cannabis is actually working. I'd like to focus today a little bit more about the legislative point of view and the system that is created around the medical marijuana, because you know a lot about that as well. Uh, 36, 36 states have legal marijuana right now in the United States. Um, what forms of cannabis are available for the patients and how many strains are on the market and is there only flowers like in Poland? I'd just like to uh, say that in Poland we have medical marijuana legalized since 2017. It uh, appeared in 2019 and since then we have pretty much three strains with high potency of THC and they are uh, for the patients, which is um, not a big choice comparing to other countries, please tell me what forms of cannabis are available in the United States right now. Yeah, that's real interesting to hear about Poland. In, um, in the United States, we first had medical cannabis laws passed in 1996. Uh, it was Proposition 215 in California. So we've had quite a lot of experience and using cannabis, you know, in a legal market. So um, we have all sorts of different products and all sorts of different strains. Ever since the beginning, um, it, you people could grow this at home, uh, caregivers could grow and then actually sell their flowers to the dispensaries. And then the dispensaries would then sell them to customers. So ever since the beginning of the passage of these laws, 
of medical cannabis. It's not like that anymore. Now there, it's much more restricted and you have to have a, a, a license in order to sell to a dispensary or grow for a dispensary. But ever since the beginning, there's been this route because um, it's rooted. It, it comes kind of from the black market because there was no market before legalization. The only market that was there was, you know, the illegal one. And so ever since the beginning, they kind of let that market build the legal market up. And when this happened, you had thousands of farmers all over the state of California and then in Colorado and then now all over, like you mentioned, I believe it was 36 states. Um, Oklahoma is very popular now, Nevada, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Michigan, all these other states. There's thousands of farmers in growing all sorts of different strains. So um, there's potentially thousands of different strains available to patients when they go to a dispensary. And, um, and this is the same thing with the recreational market. Um, recreational dispensary is oftentimes in the same building as the medical dispensary. So it, it's, it's the same place selling the same flowers, this different, you know, they have a different section for medical and a different section for recreational. And, um, and you have all sorts of different products, like we had mentioned. So you you have not only cannabis flowers, which is still the most popular one, I think over 58% of the market, I believe, or something uh, like that is still flower sales. Um, then you have um, oils. Oils are very popular. You have oils that you can vape and um, you have oils that you can eat. Um, and, uh, you know, concentrated forms of cannabis, you know, the very popular one is dabs. Um, but this goes into all sorts of forms, wax, shatter, crumble, distillate. Um, you have um, the edibles is really nice because you have pretty much every food you can imagine, um, you know, besides something that needs to be hot. But anything that can be packaged, they make. So all sorts of candies, um, this all sorts of different edibles are available. They have lotions. So you can rub cannabis on you. They have patches where you can put a patch on you. Maybe you have a pain patch, uh, something like that. Um, creams. <laughs> I'm trying to think there's so many different things. Uh, pretty much any product that you can make that requires like an oil, you can use a cannabis oil in instead or, or add it onto it. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of things that I've been seeing. Yeah, thank you for this answer. Uh, I was thinking uh, the next question, uh, referring to what you said. So basically, it started with the uh, social legalization of medical marijuana, where patients were growing and distributing that through the dispensaries to the other patients, basically. Uh, but when it became profitable business, the big pharma just took it over and it basically started from there when it started to get really mu much more popular. Is it what you're saying? I guess uh, I'm just trying to refer the situation to the European market because mostly what's happening in the US in case of even marijuana legalization is happening in Europe a few years later. So I'm trying to find a pattern what's happening there in case of medical marijuana. That's what, what can be brought to Europe here. Uh, but the question um, is, yeah, you want to add something? No, I was just saying oftentimes, uh, in my experience, the reason why it's not like it was when it started um, with so much of this market uh, being driven from individual farmers who didn't need a crazy license, it's, it's changed from this, uh, in my opinion, because companies realize that they can make money from this. And if there's, you know, a lot of little people growing and supplying the dispensaries, then, you know, that's money they could be making by supplying the dispensaries. <laughs> so okay. regulations have been put in place to prevent these farmers to do this. And they, it makes it tougher. You know, every week they pass new laws to make it tougher. Okay. Uh, well, my previous question was leading to the, the other one because we have only registered. Uh, we, we only have. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, the uh, question was leading to this one in Poland. Uh, yes, because we only have registered flowers, uh, as I said, a few strains of cannabis flowers, which are uh, imported from different country, uh, where um, which uh, products you have, there's a lot of the, the, the huge variety.
product in the US. Why is it so important from the, for the patients to have such a big choice of the products? <clears throat> and then it comes to the, the question. The next question is, is the dosage of THC most accurate? In what product gives the patients the most accurate percentage dosage of THC? I mean, uh, if you consume flowers by vaporization or, or by smoking, is the uh, amount of THC or other cannabinoids you're putting in your body more accurate than when you uh, try oil, for example, or uh, the patches you said? What's the importance um, of, of, the, uh, of the variety of the products? Well, it's an interesting form. It's, it's, it's not, it's about phrasing. And, and the, way, the way to say it kind of is how the different forms of cannabis can provide more concentrated doses um, that are more consistent. And so when you're, when you're vaporizing and smoking, uh, which is orally combusting, you know, cannabis, that gives you kind of the least amount of, of medical benefits. It, it's immediate, so it will help you immediately, but the effects will only last for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And so oftentimes it's important to have different products, like you mentioned, because these different products um, can target um, specific needs that patients might have. So some patients might not be able to, to smoke flour um, for whatever reason with their lungs or, or issue with um, c combusting cannabis. So oftentimes edibles is a great um, form to consume cannabis as well as topicals and topicals they apply pretty much consistent relief depending on how much cannabis is inside of it, as does anything. But um, when I mentioned earlier about the smoking part of it, when you ingest cannabis and uh, like orally eating it instead of um, smoking it, then you'll get more like four to eight hours of consistent medical relief from using the cannabis products instead of just the 15 minutes as opposed to um, doing it smoking. And so oftentimes um, medical patients are looking to ingest cannabis, you know, and, the, and like the one I took is the strongest form of taking cannabis. And it's just pretty much pure THC oil. And, and, you know, I ingested that orally and I ended up taking 45 grams of that oil via suppository as well. So um, you can also get extreme medical relief um, from using cannabis via suppository which is completely the opposite of smoking it and that was another product that i forgot to mention is available they have suppositories available for men and, and vaginal suppositories available for women there's all sorts of um they have everything they're putting cannabis in everything really <laughs> in the u.s so um should patients be able how hard is to prepare then this this product because right now in poland uh we uh polish pharmacopeia doesn't uh contain any recipe for any cannabis product or any topical and the oil um, this is the part that is missing we have medical marijuana legalized but the pharmacopeia isn't listing any cannabis products which doesn't allow the pharmacies which is the only thing that would allow pharmacies to produce the flower but basically and um, that's probably expensive when to which we are going to talk about later about the cost of this but the question uh, is um should patients be allowed to be allowed to produce the cannabis product and yeah basically if if that's a good idea or that should be more uh, standardized in the factory or Big Pharma should take care yeah. of this. That's actually the number one thing that I always talk about is um, the important for the importance for patients and just anybody, anybody in general, to be able to grow this plant without having to worry about being put in jail for that. Um, because it, I mean, it, it does grow naturally, but the coolest thing that I've found throughout this whole journey of of using cannabis oil was how I was able to take my health into my own hands. And so I learned how to make the oil myself. And I learned, I already knew how to grow, but I learned how to grow much better once I talked to other growers and look, was able to look up uh, more information about growing. And, um, and the process is actually, 
I, I think it's fairly simple. I've done it quite a few times, but um, it, it's a pretty straightforward process. I, I have released videos on how to make, you know, oils, whether it's like the high THC oil, how to make uh, tinctures, lotions, topicals. Um, I, I've released videos um, that are available online for free on YouTube on how to make all of these things because it is quite simple and it's something you can do at home with basic household appliances. Um, that that's really like the most mind blowing, coolest part of the journey that, uh, that I found and why I talk to people about it so much is because, you know, I was able to cure an incurable disease with, a with something I made at home, a medicine I made at home, you know, for my own garden. So, you know, there's nothing really special or unique about, about me. Anybody can learn this process. It's not difficult. Um, there are some safety dangers involved when you're making the oil. There's a pretty uh, flammable solvent required to during the process. So you just need to make sure you do it properly, exactly as explained in my video. Don't try to cut any corners. Um, that, that there's So there is a danger, but as far as um, difficulty, it, it's not a hard thing to do. And so I really believe that you know, pharmaceutical companies, um, they can do whatever they want. They should be allowed to do what I, whatever they want. They should be allowed to study it and make it into any type of medicine they want. And at the same time, I believe it's very important that we should be able to do the same thing and be able to experiment on it as well. Um, we've just found over when you sift through kind of the propaganda that, that we've been told about cannabis over the years, you find out that it's really not harmful, you know, not no one's died from overdosing from cannabis, but people die from overdosing from alcohol every day. And so the dangers that they always told us that we need to worry about really aren't there. And so that since we know that those dangers don't exist, we should be allowed to grow and kind of have fun, you know, have fun if you want to make recreational brownies or, or at the same time, you know, make serious medicine for someone who's trying to treat a disease. I think we should all be able to do this. Um, uh, you know, that's one of the most important things that I that I hope would transfer over to European laws is is this, um, you know, it's very big and popular in Europe to grow your own food in your garden. And, you know, some people even grow and make wine from their own grapes. Um, there's this this tradition of doing this. And so there, there should also be this tradition of growing hemp or growing cannabis because it's just another plant and growing it in your yard is not a danger. Well, we basically do have these traditions. We have cities called from hemp name uh, in Poland and we do have our grandmas, my grandma generation, they remember growing hemp everywhere. They, you, I, uh, from my experience talking and educating people about cannabis in Poland, looks like a generation of, let's say, my parents uh, says that it's very hard to explain to them because they were under such a huge propaganda. But then the generation of my grandparents, let's say, uh, then they just, you just need a few minutes on the converse, of the conversation. You just say that hemp is not the same than mari marijuana that contains THC. It's something that we're growing, was growing everywhere. And they just get it. Oh, yeah, my neighbor had it. My grand, my mama, my mother had it. So um, this, this is something we do have a tradition uh, yeah, here. Uh, so, uh, but my question is, uh, should patients then uh, send it to the lab? Should the, should the process of producing and pro pro processing cannabis at home somehow be standardized or tested? Or uh, how expensive it is also to do it at home? How much maybe you could, of course, I just want to point out it's illegal to process any amount of cannabis in Poland, even if it's medical cannabis from the pharmacy. For now, we are working to change that, but for now, this is the law. Uh, is it affordable for the patients to process their cannabis uh, but on their own? And uh, yeah, if it should be tested and sent to the lab. Yeah, um, of course, when we open up legalization, as I mentioned, hopefully with pharmaceutical side and, you know, side of the people for the people to be able to grow hopefully we would see more labs pop up during this process and um and as with most things that i feel when you ask me i'm going to say that i i wish that people have the choice so um that's where i think it's important would be to have the choice to test it or not some people might not want to test it 
some people want to test it. It, it depends on kind of what you're treating and, and the individual patient, um, how they go. Of course, when you get it tested, you have more of an accurate idea of exactly how much THC or, you know, whatever cannabinoid you're, you're going for. You'll have more of an ex exact idea of how much is in there. But at the same time, testing varies. So there's still a variance of plus or minus 15% um, sometimes. Um, so testing testing is great and I wish we, we could have it. Um, in terms of affordability, it's really amazing what you can do. It, it's a plant. So really, if you can grow a tomato, which is some people have difficulty growing tomatoes. I understand this. But if you have the time and energy to grow a tomato, then you have the time and energy, you know, in theory to grow cannabis. It's not uh, much more difficult. Um, if you go to a grow store today, um, it can get overwhelming because they might have 12 different types of nutrients and 20 different types of soil to choose from and 40 different lights and all sorts of different things. And that's developed with kind of the recreational legal part of cannabis. And this is kind of what we call the, the hobby market. And it's more for like hobby hobbyists. Um, if you want to grow this plant, it's not hard. You can do it with one nutrient. It doesn't have to be a bunch of different types. Um, there's all in one uh, companies out there. Um, you know, when I started, we had to use three different types of nutrients. It wasn't, you just mix them in a different ratio. Um, whether you're doing flowering or bloom. And then affordability, it, it really <clears throat> comes down to your individual space. So if you have, if you only have the capability to grow indoors, um, prices can get a little bit more expensive because you have to have artificial lighting and, um, you know, energy costs can add up. Um, if you have an outdoor space, um, growing your own cannabis to make into medicine or to smoke recreationally can be quite, quite affordable because the sun takes care of most of the costs. You just need to add some water with some nutrients, um, you know, make sure there's no pests and diseases. Um, but it, it, it can be fairly affordable. Um, so when you, when you do grow your first time, don't expect to to have like high times magazine buds, you know, um, if you want to have a very proper grow, like the ones in the pictures, a lot of these people, if they do grow outdoors, they have a very regulated greenhouse with heating and additional lighting. Um, so the, it, 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 the price can go up depending on how much you want to spend and how, how much you want to get into it. And, you know, um, but it could be pretty affordable. So that's another reason why I, I've been so excited about it is, you know, there's really so much you can do yourself at home um, with this plant. And, and I know because when I was in Colorado, I, I had a, um, a license to grow 495 plants as a caregiver. And so I've really been able to put my hands firsthand on the plant and seen this how how easy it is and uh to grow and and make into a medicine and make into something you know recreationally as well okay but okay about this license you were talking about how hard is it to get one is it like a lot of people are getting the license is it very popular to grow cannabis right now or is it something to focus on and just devote your life to as you did to cannabis just to be one of the people who got it well, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, how regulations get tighter every week. Um, they kind of pushed pushed people like myself out of Colorado. When I had my license, I believe there was either 97 or 120, like six, uh, different people who had the same license I had. They called it an extended plant count license where I can have, I personally can grow 99 plants. And then as a caregiver, uh, I could grow up for up to five other patients. So if they had 99 plants, I could grow their plants for them. And um, this, I think, is a very important aspect to include in okay. legalization. <laughs> because um, many times, many times when, when legalization happens, 
patients get forgotten about. And it's, it's important to not forget about the patients. The patients should have the easiest access to this, to this plant. And so a lot of the times, patients might not want to spend the dispensary prices because it's very expensive and they have to have a lot of cannabis every day. So they can have a friend grow for them because maybe they're in a wheelchair. You know, maybe it's maybe they're stuck in a bed in the, and they can't get out of the bed. So it's it's difficult for patients like this to be able to grow. You know, they can't physically get up and go take care of the plants. So this is kind of why we had this caregiver law in place. And um, I think it's very important and crucial to include because um, you could really help a lot of people with this, with this plant. And um, now, now you can't grow more than 12 plants, I, pr I believe in most of Colorado, um, except for maybe one or two small counties. Um, but they've made new laws that basically supersede the old laws. Um, so no matter how many people live in one house or how many plants the doctor tells you that you can grow, um, now your city government generally is telling you if you grow over 12 plants, you, you could be um, facing criminal penalties. Well, I'm fixing a little bit on the quality because that sounds like a really good system for the patients and their caregiver and their caregivers to be able to grow marijuana, medical marijuana, uh, which is something I think could be very uh, profitable even here in Poland because the medical marijuana is very expensive uh, for the patients right now and not many patients just can't afford it from from the pharmacies, which means they are still staying on the black market, which is uh, basically cheaper right now uh, which we want to uh, avoid this we kind of wanted to avoid the situation but it happened anyway so my question is still about the quality of the product so uh, eight for 36 states that have legalized medical marijuana half of them 18 states have legalized growing medical marijuana as well for the patients so i know you are supporting the idea of growing by the patients, but don't you think uh, it should be more standardized if the patients are uh, able to do it properly, if the quality of the product should be as well, I don't think you answered, if should be tested in the lab, should the patients send their plants and their product, uh, which means, for example, oil or tincture to the lab to make sure about the percentage from the pr practical point of view. Uh, how about the standardization and the uh, controlling the process of production. Do you think how much uh, this free market for the patient, like legal cannabis market for the medical marijuana market for the patients should be controlled? Uh, that's that's actually a pretty good question. Um, I'm glad you, you asked that. And, and kind of just like I touched on earlier, I'm all about choice. And so I believe that patients should have the choice. And so um, quality can vary from farmer to farmer um, and from patient to patient if they're growing. And, you know, if you're a beginner patient, uh, a beginner grower, your flowers and your products are not going to be as good as someone who's been doing it for 10 years or 15 years. Um, so so the, the levels can vary. And so there's kind of two different ways to kind of look at it. There's a way to look at it in terms of personal consumption. And then there's a way to look at it in terms of uh, farmers and, and, you know, patients may be growing to sell uh, to someone else other than themselves. In this kind of situation, then, of course, you know, I'd, you'd probably want to lean towards testing at least more of a fair, independent, third-party testing um, organization, because then you can have more of a better idea of what is inside what you're buying. And so, you know, oftentimes, the number one thing I always talk about, because you know, in my journey myself, when I went through is I grew this myself. And so if you want to get the cheapest and the cheapest medicine um, or cheapest flowers with the exact quality that you want, the, the, the best way to do this is to grow it yourself. And so in this case, you know, maybe you might not want to send it to get tested because hey, you grow it, you grew it, you know what, um, what um fertilizer you put in it 
um, you know, if you put pesticides on it or not, you know everything about the plant because you grew it. Um, so I guess that's, it's, it's all about choice. You know, I, I would like to see a legalization kind of happen where there isn't really, there's less restrictions on it, especially for personal consumption, I guess is how I should kind of really clarify everything. Um, if you're, if you're doing this yourself, um, there's really no reason to control this in terms of, you know, in the U S the reason why cannabis is federally illegal is because it has no medicinal value. It's a schedule one drug. And so we now know that this is false. You no, know, we've, we've known that this was false since the seventies. I had somebody message me today who said that the, he was alive when this study came out in 1972 or 1973, when it said that cannabis has medical value and can possibly cure um, diseases like cancer and this type of thing. Um, when the government got the patent on a, uh, THC cannabis um, for oils um, and it's I really believe that that the only reason that it's not still legal or the reason we we can't do this is because other people have an interest in not allowing us to do this because you know like myself for example I can only really talk about myself because everything else is speculation if I'm to talk about anything else going on out there and so with me specifically, someone who, who had Crohn's disease generally would go to the hospital, you know, they could go once a week. I had a, a close friend who would go to the hospital every week for something relating to a Crohn's disease. Well, you know, since I've been taking the oil, I haven't gone to the doctor. I haven't needed to go get a medicine. Um, so since I haven't been spending my money, there's people losing the money that I would be spending there, you know? And so I kind of think that these people, the, they're, these people who are losing money are also friends with government, politicians. And so I think this is kind of why we're still facing uh, resistance when it comes to letting everybody grow this plant instead of just letting a select few grow it with very restrictive licensing. Okay. Well, um, thank you for this answer. I think that was an honest one. Um, well, that still is bringing me to uh, the other point of view, which is um, big pharma. Uh, I know there's a big, it's a huge part of the American market right now, the, uh, all the edibles, all the medical products that are other than uh, flowers, but also the flowers. This is mostly, uh, are mostly distributed by big companies, not small growers right now. Uh, so the question is, what are the benefits or of uh, in medical marijuana, do you think it's important? There are some uh, good sides, uh, the advantages of utilization uh, of medical growing medical marijuana and producing it. And is it come? Uh, does it? How does it go with in terms with the price of these products? Where does the high pro price of uh, cannabis products is coming from? From the big pharma. Um, well, Big Pharma, their main thing is to make profits. Um, they want to be able to, to prof, to, you know, to monetize treatments. That's, that's their number one focus. And so, uh, like I mentioned earlier, when cannabis is, is, is listed as a schedule one drug in the United States, um, because it has no medical value. We know this to be untrue because big pharmaceutical companies are rushing to make cannabis medicines out of it, and they themselves already have medicines made out of cannabis. Um, and so this kind of your question, to go with your question, what benefits do we see with legalization is that I feel kind of with the whole topic I've been going on with today when we allow everybody access to cannabis instead of this pharmaceutical access, which to be honest, pharmaceutical companies have been able to use cannabis if they wanted to since the seventies, pretty much. Um, they've been able to do research. They've been able to do studies, you know, so there, there have been studies this whole time. They've been able to do it. 
Um, what I think the benefits of legalization for everyone, for all would be is, in my opinion, we see very little, I've personally seen very little innovation when it comes to cannabis based medicine, medicinal products um, from pharmaceutical companies. Their products are very standardized and very limited. They don't offer very much choice. Whereas when they legalize cannabis for everybody to grow in the United States and California and Colorado and these places, we instantly had a tremendous amount of market innovation. This is where we have all these different types of products I mentioned earlier available for patients who just have to go, you know, a hundred meters down the street to get it. You know, they, this, this happened because legalization was allowed for everybody. Um, so this is kind of really why I think that there, the, there's tremendous benefit in allowing everybody access to cannabis is because we really will be able to see all the different possibilities that can be done with it. We'll have so many different people around the world, all trying to make cannabis medicines and making different ones that, you know, once they share this to the market and they share this with their friends and they share this online, then someone else can get it and innovate on it and make it better and make it better and make it better and better. And so this is when I think we would really see the advancement that so many people have been craving um, by having cannabis illegal for so long, we'll finally see this advancement happen if we can make it legal for everybody instead of just for a few. Okay, so basically what you're saying is that a high price of uh, corporate products, uh, medical marijuana products is coming from a high price also of uh, innovation and research that those companies are also conducting. And that's, and I, I very much agree that we agree with that because our goal basically is to create a chart which says the percentage of in, each cannabinoids that is necessary to treat each disease, the perfect one, and which strain should be used in which that's combination. This is, this is the, the main goal where banner. we are heading. Oh, yeah. I just yeah. Saw your banner. And, uh, and that's, that's exactly what I was going to mention is, um, is this is kind of the, I, the ideal kind of standpoint that is discussed a lot um, around the circles with GMP standards being introduced um, in the production of cannabis, medical cannabis, is that they do want to, to kind of get a, a full cannabinoid profile kind of done um, on yourself. Because a lot of the discussion around cannabis, um, specifically using it for medicine, is that every person is different and they may react differently to cannabis um, because there's so many different types and there isn't this, this standardization. And so um, there, there could be tremendous value in what they want to do with this, this test where they can kind of basically see your deficiencies. They'll see your whole profile of cannabinoids and say, oh, okay, well, maybe you have enough DHT, you have enough CBD, but you're lacking in THB or you're lacking in CBN or something. And in this instance, um, the pharmaceutical companies would like to create kind of a, um, a specific um, kind of more, I don't know, more specific um, medicine created just to fill the def deficiencies you have. And um, I think this is a very interesting idea and I would like to see this happen um, because just like I mentioned earlier okay. with, with innovation happening, you know, once, once there is legalization, innovation is gonna happen everywhere. So the companies, just like you said, will, will take something they see and then improve on it. And then another company will improve on it. Another company will improve on it. Um, so there, there really is kind of an exciting future um, that we can get to witness in our lifetime, hopefully. Okay, thank you for, for this answer. Uh, well, I'd like to just mm, sum this up with the question about the because uh, once you answered about the benefits of um, of producing uh, cannabis uh, by the patients and. Um, 
the uh, production at home. So I'd like to ask you about the medical marijuana, but uh, used by sports people. This is your field. This is your uh, field of expertise. So I'd like to ask you about the professional athletes. Uh, they should use cannabis should they be um, controlled with this if they are a medical patient should it be allowed uh, for professional athletes to use cannabis yeah this is a this is a, a one of the uh, points that's really important to me as well one of the topics that I um, am recently getting more involved with um, I want to say that I think it was the Major League Baseball in the United States, I believe they um, stopped testing for THC. Uh, the National Hockey League removed some of the penalties for testing positive for THC. Um, I, I, I think the NFL is talking about it. The NBA certainly, of course. Uh, you know, I could be wrong. I haven't looked this up in, in uh, some time. I, I formally put a petition in myself to the uh, International Wakeboard Federation um, and Water Ski Federation, because uh, this is what I'm involved in personally. And, you know, with my research, I feel, you know, there is medical value. I have a prescription for cannabis use, so certainly I should not be tested. Um, but I put in a, a formal petition to remove THC from the testing from, from the IWWF, for the, the Wakeboard uh, Commission, because I think we do need to um, step into the 21st century and it's not a performance enhancing drug if anything since legalization has been happening and products and athletes have been able to officially endorse products um we've been seeing benefits so many benefits from having uh products made from cannabis from thc and cbd um i myself um i'm a wake skater i'm sixth number six in the world currently on wake skating and um i have a company that makes cbd full spectrum with thc oils and and lotions and this kind of thing and we have 20 athletes from all around the world um, and we're growing quick you know and all all of us we're all using lotions and oils and it, it's it helps in the recovery um personally <laughs> I'm starting to get older and as an athlete, it's harder. It's harder for your body to work the way it did when it was younger. And so recovery is a very important thing for, for athletes. And especially those of us who are getting, you know, more older or just even pushing yourself to the full extreme, your body takes a beating and it gets sore and it, 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 it gets overused. And so being able to to have THC, um, you know, even flowers, this being able to smoke um, cannabis can help the mental problems that an athlete can face every day. It's very challenging to overcome some of the um, physical obstacles we have we have to we have to challenge on a daily basis. Things that that frighten us and push up push us to the extremes and the limits that our body can go and our, and our fears and um, things that we have to address every day. Um, THC can help with all, with everything. Um, of course, um, it's, it would be great. You know, we could have all sorts of different things, edibles. Um, so that's the, that's the next thing I'm hoping that the kind of the market will open up more in Europe. Um, you know, if we have more discussions like this one, um, and we're able to get some of the more more people who can learn about cannabis and know that it's not such a deadly, dangerous drug. And um, we can hopefully get legalization and have THC not only for athletes, but for everybody. Because, hey, maybe you had a hard day at work and you pushed yourself way too hard. You know, it'd be great to have some THC lotion to put on your on your body after that. Okay, thank you for this answer. This is your uh, very interesting point of view of yours. 
Um, what about drivers then? Uh, because some states allow uh, medical marijuana patients to drive, only a few though, and it only it's only about five nanogram uh, of THC per milliliter of blood. I think Germany has a uh, higher uh, dosage of this. Uh, what is your opinion about drivers? And does it really impact driving? Uh, what, what's your opinion there? This is one that I'll start off with something a little unique too. I will issue a personal challenge right now <laughs> to anybody who wants to really test this. Um, I will offer myself as a test subject and um, we can try myself sober and we can try myself on THC and we can really test kind of if there's a difference. Um, I know there's all sorts of um, different information available out there online telling you THC may be bad and may affect driving. There's articles that say THC does not impair driving. Um, so this is kind of one of the hot button uh, issues that politicians, of course, love to bring up. Um, and this is another one that, you know, I can only speak from my own perspective. Personally, um, I don't have issues with consuming cannabis and driving. There's this can also be explained by myself being kind of like an expert user. You know, I'm, I'm not someone who's this the first time using THC and being laughing and giggling and Ooh, this is fun and yay. Like I'm seeing things and, and stuff like that. I have gained a tolerance. And so it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it, it's just incorrect in my opinion to, judge somebody's impairment based on how many nanograms are in their system. Um, I think if they really want to test for impairment, I think something more along the classical lines of a DUI test would be perfect, where you could see someone's motor skills if they are, um, if they are indeed impaired, then hey, give them, you know, an impaired driving ticket. But if you, if someone has perfect motor skills, but they smell like they had 10 blunts, that there's nothing wrong with that. You know, the, the, the law is driving impaired or not. So I think um, there should be a better way to test this other than this, oh, you have over X amount of cannabis in your blood, you're impaired. It, it's not like alcohol. Often the comparisons, politicians constantly want to make the comparisons of cannabis with alcohol. And time and time again, we're seeing that the regulate like alcohol model doesn't work. I, I think something more like regulate to, like tomatoes, you know, something that's a natural plant that really isn't dangerous from consuming, from consumption of it. Um, I think that should be more kind of the laws we should base around instead of something based on narcotics like alcohol. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, referring to what you're saying, uh, last year I've been hosting a medical cannabis conference where I've been talking to our lawyers and not only lawyers, first the doctors, and they said that it's about two weeks of the tolerance. After using cannabis constantly for two weeks, your body kind of gets uh, the tolerance level is high enough just so it, it, it's not impairing your uh, driving or motor, any motor skills. Uh, another thing is that some patients are using cannabis for, well, all patients are using that for actual medical reasons. They are, and the cannabis is cannabis is making them just feel better. It's taking the pain away. It's taking the symptoms away. So that's basically making them better drivers without the pain, without the uh, epileptic attack or any kind of um, sickness that can come up and any kind of symptoms that can come up with, come up without using uh, cannabis before driving. So basically, they need that to be safer drivers. That's how I see see that yeah, but also uh also our uh, lawyers tell us uh, uh at the conference he said something very interesting he was advising the medical marijuana patients to uh ask the police officer for field sobriety test which is not very popular here we actually polish drivers are used to being tested by the machine and that's it and is it actually popular to make a field sobriety test for the drivers in the us is it actually happened that you have to stay straight keep your arms uh, walk in the line and just uh, proof that you are pretty much sober because the uh, advice that was given to Polish drivers was that you should ask the police officer to be recorded to have any kind of proof in the court later that you 
your driving on motor skills were in pretty much impact. So you and if your pupils were dilated or uh, any kind of symptoms that were uh, indicating that you were under in the, under the influence. Uh, is it popular that this kind of sobriety test is performed in the US? And uh, do you think it's a good idea to ask for it? Um, it it's kind of one of those things that like I can speak only about the U.S. and my personal experiences. And so personally, as a as, as a male in the United States, um, anytime I get in, in an interaction with police, they're they're trying to harass me. They're trying to agitate me. They're trying to make they're trying to get me for something. Um, they don't want to walk away from me without taking me with them to jail. You know, that's their goal. That's how they get money. That's what, you know, that, that justifies their existence. If they have people in, in, in jail, then they are needed basically. And, uh, it's gotten out of hand where every, as a cannabis user, I've always had to look over my back in the United States. Um, because this, they could just say they smelled it, and that's enough to take me to jail. There's no way to prove on a video or any way that an officer smelled cannabis or not. Um, and so this kind of test, testing to use cannabis, it's 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 very objective, and so. I think the advice the lawyers gave you here in Poland is great and sound advice. I think that should be followed all the time. Um, always try to, I mean, always record your interactions with police because they can say anything. They can say you did something. And at least the way it works in the United States is, well, the cop said this and you're saying this. And the judge is not going to believe you because the judge is going to believe a cop because he's a cop and that's his job. And he's, he's, he's more higher ranking than you. So he has more credibility. So what you say doesn't matter. And what the policeman says does matter. So, um Sorry, if the, I just want to just interrupt one uh, thing. That's what the, uh, our lawyer said, that um, this is what actually with, uh, the, the court case is happening a few months later. So basically, the police officer, he doesn't really remember you. He doesn't really know what happened at the scene. You were there. You remember you were uh, you were sober and you your driving and motor skills were an impact. But the police officer, they just, he, just, he just doesn't remember that. That's why you're supposed to to be recorded during the uh, control, driving control, uh, then so you can prove anything to the court. You just have to say that you have very, I mean, you work, but he just not, he's not going to remember you in a few months where, when the court case is going to take place. So uh, this is the thing that he, he, he has authority over what you are saying, but also he, even he means well, right? He just wants to take a not sober uh, driver away from the streets. That's his job. And he just doesn't know that it, he's not kind of doing that properly, but it's not pretty much his fault. It's education. We are still going back to education, right? It's education. Hopefully. Hopefully there's no malicious intent. Uh, well, also, um, what I wanted to ask you, we, we referring to what you said, you have this private jail system in, in the US. And basically, if there is a lot of free spots in jail, I would think that they are filling it up with at least serious crimes, which is also the cannabis uh, users. And this is what was happening in the US. But interesting thing I, I'd like to add here, uh, during my university studies, we had this course about the uh, economical modeling. Uh, and I created this model to check if this is what is happening here. So the more free spots in Polish jails, the more cannabis users get to jail. So I used the data for uh, past few ten, ten or ten or more years, and what came up was the which means the more free spaces in jail, the least cannabis smokers uh, get to jail, basically for possession uh, of little amounts of marijuana. So it means um, the level of crime crime 
in Poland is basically the same rate than the level of uh, imprisoning cannabis smokers. So it's exactly the opposite uh, of from the United States. But this is basically we don't have the private jail system and it doesn't influence it like that. So I think that's a good thing that's happening here comparing to uh, to the US. Uh, so uh, another question I'd like to ask you said about the how hard it is to get the license to grow cannabis uh, in United States as a caregiver. But also I'd like to ask uh, how hard it is to get mar medical marijuana card. Uh, as just a patient, you just go to the doctor because uh, in the US each state has a list of limited diseases that can uh, that allow doctors to prescribe medical marijuana for uh, to the patients. But in Poland, we have this great thing that we don't have any list. Any doctor in Poland can prescribe marijuana for any sort of problem uh, or, or disease. Why? Uh, so how hard it is to get medical marijuana card in the US right now? Um, in the states that I've been to, it's it's actually pretty easy. And, um, and also, you know, there, there's some open caregiver laws. So I don't want to say all the laws are, are tight, but it's like, what happens is once a new law passes in a state, then there's then there's the ability for pretty much everybody to go grow there. And then as as soon as that new law is passed, then the politicians come and restrict that new law to make it difficult for people like caregivers to grow and even patients. And luckily, with the medical marijuana cards and the medical cannabis cards, we we haven't seen that. That's one thing. Thankfully, they have not been touching, um, but prices have have risen. So it used to be just just like it was for growing in a, in a new place or you know making medicine yourself. Um, eventually, the laws come and then the prices raise. So so you it, it can cost more money. But in terms of actually availability and being able to get a card for using cannabis for medicine is actually pretty quite simple. And um, oftentimes you might not even know you qualify for one of the diseases, but um, your doctor can kind of, if you just go talk to your doctor about it, he can kind of walk you through the process and say, oh yeah, actually, well, maybe you have problems sleeping. And because of this, I can I can get you a card. Um, and so it's it's actually quite easy to get a card. And um, and, you know, we've had great medical programs. Um, unfortunately, most of the most of them get kind of restricted and shut down. OK, that's very interesting what you're saying. So basically, we um, are getting close to an hour. So I'd like to maybe ask you the last question that there is uh, coming up from people that are listening to us. I try to uh, watch your comments. And if they fit our conversation, I put them up. But here there is one question. Uh, how can we get in touch with this man? We would like to find out more. Uh, I know that you have a channel where you where you explain a lot of what you're saying. Uh, maybe you can bring our audience to this channel. Sure, I'm all over. Uh, I'm all over social media. So um, my number one kind of platform that I started on. Um, I'm not as active, but I still respond to messages. Um, for sure is on Facebook. So just facebook.com slash Mike Wise Show. Like you're watching a television show, Mike Wise Show. Um, and that's kind of my handle on most things. It's so on Instagram, Mike Wise Show, YouTube, Mike Wise Show. Um, LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn as Mike Wise. Um, but YouTube and uh, Facebook is definitely the main places. I have tons of videos, like I mentioned. Um, because I really want to try to do what I can to help people. So, you know, if I can't get the law changed, I can at least help make videos to show you how to do it if you need to do it. Um, uh, so that's what I try to do. There's a lot of educational videos um, specifically made for patients, but they're for anybody. Um, and you can ask me any questions. Um, I answer all questions. Uh, 
some other people kind of I've noticed they, they charge fees and this kind of thing but uh, I do it all for free send me a message uh, it might take me like a week to respond but I will get to it eventually uh, and we you know we can talk to you if you have a specific disease or a problem um, you know I can, I can kind of tell you help help share what I know with you Thank you very much for this invitation. I think uh, some people may, uh, may may find it very useful. Thank you for this time. Thank you for sharing your opinion about things I've asked you about. Um, I'm going to just uh, sum it up in Polish, if you will. And we thank you, Mike, for taking part uh, in, in the conversation. Dziękuję wszystkim, którzy oglądali, którzy słuchali dzisiejszej rozmowy. Zapraszam na podsumowanie, które pojawi się w wydarzeniu, które zapowiada webinarów. Już w czwartek odbędzie się kolejne spotkanie. O godzinie 18 porozmawiam z Piotrem Lirojem Marcem na temat jego wizji racjonalnej legalizacji marihuany w Polsce. Tymczasem dziękuję wszystkim, którzy wzięli udział w dzisiejszym webinarze. Thank you everybody. Uh, I I'd like to thank everyone who took part in today's webinar and uh, see you on Thursday on the next part in Polish uh, with our pre uh, parliament member. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mike. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Bye.